Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to start the, the main or more important session of this symposium where when we will listen to, to, of our, of our, to, to our prize winners. This is to some extent very special what we are doing this year, this is the first time in the history of the prize where we have one scientist and one politician who are combined by the links you will hear about, but who are totally different. We are, normally we are gathering people with the same kind of research, research and this time, this time it's, it's different. And I suppose much more interesting. So welcome, and I would like to start with welcoming my co-chair, Professor Lawrence Sherman, Cambridge, who will be giving the jury motivation for the prize. Please, Larry. Thank you, Professor Sarnetsky. It is um, my duty this evening to uh, present the official motivation at the prize award ceremony. I will only briefly say um, by a few words of introduction that uh, this year's prize was awarded to reflect the importance of assembling facts to inform the world's policies on drug abuse. And the way in which we have proceeded is to focus um, uh, at one level on contribution of incredibly important facts that had been resisted by a number of governments, including Australia's um, um, police chief's recommendation that a randomized controlled trial on heroin-assisted therapy uh, be undertaken um, in the 1990s, and it was uh, rejected by the then Prime Minister of Australia. But uh, the same idea uh, was developed uh, in Switzerland, where um, the uh, elected official in charge had what um, we are very proud to call uh, the courage uh, to find out, to, to dare to know, to uh, bring these facts to the table in ways that have influenced so many other places. So we begin with <clears throat> the major breakthrough of a very important fact in the context of what we've already heard yesterday is a massive amount of uh, facts, uh, none of which by themselves uh, can provide major guidance, uh, but all of which taken together uh, can certainly inform uh, better policies for managing drugs. So our first speaker, as you know, uh, is the former president of the Swiss Federation uh, and also uh, uh, for many years a member of cabinet responsible for policies uh, in this area. Um, and uh, that is um, Ms. Ruth Dreyfus, who is currently chair of the Global Drug Policy Commission. She will be uh, followed <clears throat> in alphabetical order by uh, Professor Peter Reuter, uh, who has been synthesizing and uh, analyzing the wide range of facts uh, concerning drug abuse policies uh, to advise governments around the world on how to apply them to their special contexts <clears throat> in the distinctive characteristics of each of those countries. I should say, especially for those who have sessions at three o'clock, that there's been a slight revision in the schedule and we will be going till uh, 2.45 uh, to give you 15 minutes for uh, going on to the next uh, sessions, uh, not uh, 2.30 as advertised. So with no further ado, please let me ask you uh, to welcome our first prize winner, Ms. Ruth Dreyfus. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank the board, that, uh, the jury that gave me the prize. We will have time this uh, uh, evening and we will be together. So let me start immediately by my lecture. We are currently witnessing growing dissonances in the relationship 
between science, public opinion, or society, and politics. Let me recall the debate on climate change. For many years, the scientific community is deepening the knowledge about the interaction between human activities and the global warming, some speaking about a new geological era they called Anthropocene. The public opinion is worried about the increase of extreme draw, fire infernos, cold, rainfalls, about the migration of plants and insects, the fallouts on agriculture activities. And yet, some politicians, among them most predominantly the President of the United States of America, deny both the conclusion of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the concerns of the people. Not only do these politicians refuse to change direction, but they intend to e increase greenhouse gas emission, promoting national growth and specific interests like those of mining areas, car production, and airline companies. In many countries, the difficulty to reach the level of protection against transmissible diseases, measles outbreaks being only the most recent of these topical problems, points to a deep crack in the trust between scientists and people. In a context particularly charged with emotion, the context that directly concerns the health of their own children, parents are inclined to be believe the old hoax of the risk of getting autism by vaccines, a risk that, not, uh, that has not been confirmed by extensive serious research. They don't weigh the effective protection given by vaccines to individuals and the population at large. Here, I wonder, how can politicians be more persuasive than a ped pediatrician? How can authorities be brought to oblige because they are not able to convince. I could add another case of an announced disaster, the rise of multi-antimicrobial resistance, calls to reduce the non-medical use and, uh, of antibiotics and to adopt good practices in the doctor offices and hospitals are becoming louder and louder. But the necessary measures in cattle breeding and in prescribing are opposed in favor of short-term economic interests, and governments don't act swiftly and strongly enough. Is science, the modern Cassandra, knowing about the doomed future but condemned to be unheard? But another example of the dissonance between science, society, and politics is the theme of this year's Stockholm Criminology Symposium, Drug Policy. For nearly 60 years, decisions have been taken by governments in their countries and in international fora without enough knowledge regarding the motivation of people to use drugs, regarding the consequences of their policies, regarding the links with other fields of their action, like development, housing, jobs, and so on, even regarding the potential harms and benefits of the substances they prohibit severely. Because of this lack of precise information, the population is unable to forge, forge its own opinion and remains a victim of false perception over the real amplitude of the problem, sees the prejudice against and the stigmatization of people who use drugs validated by their criminalization, and enter periodically in real panics. The current opioid panic, the legend of the crack babies, and of the crimes committed under influence of cannabis. As a consequence, the public calls for a tough hand repressing drug use. While many scientists work on different aspects of the multifaceted topic, their voices are hardly heard by politicians. As you heard, in the triangle formed by science, public opinion, and politics, 
The experience I want to share with you is that of a politician, someone who was in charge of drafting bills, explaining to the parliament and to the citizens their necessity, aims and means, and after the final adoption of a new or overhauled law, in charge of its implementation and evaluation. This implies the inclusion of experts and opposite, opposed interest groups. To overcome the tension between science, public opinion, and politics is perhaps the most challenging task for politicians. Which tools are at their disposal? Which questions should be raised and answered with the help of science? My lecture reflects my own experience, mainly in the field of drug policy, linked with so many other fields of state activities and societal realities. I am borrowing some words and definition from several mainly Swiss professors in law specialized in what we call in French logistic, generally translated poorly, I must say, into English by legislative drafting. My main source is a recent book written by Professor Alexandre Flückiger from the University of Geneva. As Flückiger writes, I translate poorly perhaps also and quote, a law is relevant if reaching its aim, it solves the society's problem without creating disproportionate, undesirable consequences." Unquote. Well, I guess nobody would object this definition, and yet it is not at all easy to implement in real political life. The first difficulty lays in the identification of the problem, its sources, and its real amplitude. Two examples taken from drug policy can be discussed here, one international, another national. In the long history of international treaties on drugs, beginning 100 years ago, what was considered as the issue changed. First, the focus was on the smuggling of drugs, undermining colonial state monopolies, and the possibility to adopt different national regimes. Then, the focus shifted to the risk for the nascent, uh, pharmaceutical, nascent pharmaceutical industries to meet obstacles in the procurement of the substances they needed for the production of medicines and to see those medicines diverted into black market. These problems could mainly be solved by regulating the international trade of a limited number of substances, leaving the countries choose how to organize the domestic market, how to control the consumption, and to deal with the health and social consequences of misuse of drugs. After World War II, under the influence of the United States of America, the definition of the, problem of the problem changed. The focus now shifted to the idea that, I quote, the addiction to nar narcotic drugs constitutes a serious evil for individual and is fraught with social and economic danger for mankind, unquote. In no other UN convention, you will find such strong language belonging to a more religious, moral, ideological vocabulary register than, uh, rather than to a legal one. The parties to the single convention on narcotic drugs of 1961 accepted, therefore, I quote again, their duty to prevent and combat this uh, evil, unquote. A commitment taken as I told before, without a robust base of knowledge about the substances, the people involved, the reason why they use drugs and how, the functioning of the black market, the economics of production, and so on. To illustrate what seems perhaps to be a very severe judgment, let me just give one example. 
The cornerstone of the international drug control regime is the classification of the illegal psychoactive substances. Resulting from a political decision making, there is a little or no correlation between the least and scientifically assessed harm and medical benefits. It is therefore not surprising that the proposed solution was and still is a dramatic overreaction. My second example is national. In my country, the narcotic law was adopted without great discussion in accordance with the two first international conventions and its impact was hardly ever subject of investigation or questioning until the mid-80s. Then, confronted with the rampant AIDS epidemic, the need to identify the HIV and how it spread into society was urgent. Not only epidemiology was mobilized, but also social sciences, among them medicine, psychiatry, sexology, criminology, and sociology. One important source of the contamination is, as you know, the use of unclean injection devices among people who inject drugs. The drug problem had shifted from a general condemnation of the illegal drugs consumption, which was quite abstract for the whole society and not uh, uh, an issue that uh, was uh, really in concern, to the very specific one, how to prevent the harms caused by the way drugs are consumed. In hidden place, in sordid promiscuity with shared syringes by people in poor health condition with difficulties to access public services, people who are stigmatized. Having identified the issue, politics could begin to handle and develop experiments and new pragmatic responses. In Flückiger's definition, a law is only relevant if it is designed in such a way that it contributes to the realization of its aims. First of all, the objective have to, has to be realistic and achievable. The means have also to be adapted to the task proportional to the amplitude of the problem to be corrected and in accordance with the fundamental principles of the Constitution and Human Rights Convention. Coming back to the three international drug conventions, the aims seem to be out of reach. Promoting a society free of drugs and the abuse, the, therefore eradicating the, the cultivation and production of drugs are not reachable. After more than a century of the drug control regime, the production and the consumption have both increased and new psychoactive substances enter the market every month. The other aim, weakening through, in, weakening through international collaboration the power and the profit of criminal organization active in the drug business might be achievable, but the measures taken have not been successful everywhere. In the Swiss experience, the focus of harm reduction contradicted initially the narcotic law and its punitive approach. It implied in a limited frame the, to abandon the aim to reduce the consumption through its repression. The enforcement of the narcotic law had to give way to measures and spaces in which consumption was accepted and people who used these spaces were helped without prerequisite and questioning. Furthermore, those in charge of imposing law and order, the members of the police and even prof uh, pr prison professionals, were asked to protect these services and not to interfere negatively with the medical and social personnel. It is a paradox to prohibit the use of drugs on one hand and on the other one to offer to the person consuming them what they need so as to make consumption as harmless as possible. This contradiction had to be addressed by the political authorities and explained to the population. The consensus regarding the aims of this policy, which was the fight against HIV AIDS epidemic, made the paradox acceptable as soon as it was possible to show that the objective was on the way to be realized. <clears throat>
The second innovation was the heroin-assisted therapy. The difficulty to explain that it was effective and beneficial to replace street heroin by prescribed medical heroin in the frame of a therapy was overcome thanks a five or six years long experiment designed and monitored by a multidisciplinary disciplinary scientific team under the leadership of Professor Ambrose Uchtenhagen, who is sitting here. Thank you, Ambrose. The dramatic drop in petty criminality among the participants of the project was only one of the results that convinced the parliament and the citizens to introduce hat and harm reduction in the overall narcotic law. The third touchstone for testing the relevance of a public policy is that it doesn't create disproportionate undesirable undesir consequences. In Switzerland, as in many other countries during the last 40 years, the negative consequences of the prohibition became visible in terms of health hazard, both on the individual and collective levels. A growing gap in credibility between the population and the authorities widens because the latter remains stuck between the, its helplessness in front of the existing large black market that can be visible in some more popular neighborhoods, a still punitive approach to drug consumption implemented arbitrarily, and I would say it is always and everywhere applied arbitrarily, its verbal commitment to promote a drug-free society, and at the same time, its reluctance to make the active step of decriminalization the use of, the, of the use of drugs and experiment cautiously with the possibility of state-regulated market. Such a credibility gap is due to the disproportionate undesirable consequences, is also one of the disproportionate undesirable consequences of many current drug policy. On a global perspective, the explosion of the number of people incarcerated has dramatic effects on their life, on the social cohesion, and the economic development of many countries. Human rights violation, cruel and degrading treatments, even death penalty and extrajudiciary killings are perpetrated as tools of inhuman drug policies. The empowerment of criminal organizations is, is largely built on their drug business, that for years remained their most lucrative activity. Corruption, the undermining of state institutions, the disruptive economy financed through money laundering are also to be listed among the negative consequences or at least failures of the current drug control regime. The last question I would like to offer for discussion is what are the tools able to associate science and expertise with the political process and help convince the population? The following list, and I have to go very quickly through, is what, in my view, should be done and what I tried humbly, at least punctually, to do. Well, first, help to create a general rational climate contributing to a better understanding of the scientific contribution to the identification and solution of societal problems. Two, promote research programs on topics of public interest on the basis of call for bids upstream to the political process. Three, proceed to ex ante impact assessment on proposed policies, not only on its specific field, but also on others which might be touched. Four, yes, four. Introduce in all important laws the obligation to evaluate periodically its effects, define a battery of indicators which will be collected and provide sufficient resources, finance and human for this evaluation. Five, in some fields, create systems of sentinels and reporting in order to be able to react as soon as possible when, for example, a health threat suddenly occurs. 
And I cannot illustrate all these points, but on this point, just to have, for instance, a, a constant current control of what is on the market, what is the quality of the things that are to be found, the sewage analysis in the black waters uh, uh, to see what is consumed when and where, this is a kind of sentinel we absolutely uh, need to know what is uh, going and what are the threats, uh, possibly, of a uh, drug, uh, drug market. Uh, I think I am now at six, perhaps at seven, at the possibility to authorize pilot project and a strong scientific criteria to test reforms of, on their relevance, efficacy, and risk, and use their result to enter into a process of changing the rule. This is exactly what we did with the heroin assistant, uh, uh, therapy, assisted therapy, in the sense that for six years we did, we did use just in the law an article about the medical and scientific use of heroin, which was prohibited, and it was only after having received all the information about uh, the uh, experiment that uh, we changed the law and opened also a broad and uh, well-informed debate with the population. And this is my last point. Open as soon as possible a well-informed debate within the population because without their support, you will not be able to change uh, what has to be changed. I thank you for your attention. If you'd like to sit down. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I now invite uh, Professor Reuter to take the stage. May I wish to come closer so you can... Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to deliver this lecture. I've spent much of my career studying the harmful consequences of prohibition. The simple fact is that most of the harms that we observe associated with illegal drugs arise from the fact that these addictive and or intoxicating substances are prohibited. Provocative as that statement may seem, as strong a statement as it appears to be in favor of legalization, its meaning rests on one word that does not stand out, namely, observe. For the benefits of prohibition are difficult to observe, certainly to measure in a systematic fashion they are about counterfactuals. What we can measure and respond to emotionally, both in, and, and in policy, is the disease, crime, and ongoing corrupting influence of the consumption and distribution of adulterated and expensive drugs. What we cannot measure and respond to is the reduction in addiction and associated harms that may be generated by uh, making these substances illegal, depriving them of access to uh, the advantages of modern technology and distribution systems and markets. Robert McCoon and I spent 10 years trying to assess the evidence and arguments for drug legalization. I note that we, like Robert Muller, published a 450-page tome that satisfied neither side, neither those who favored legalization nor those who defended current policies. But unlike Special Prosecutor Muller, uh, we do stand ready to amplify our views. Uh, drug war heresies, learning from other vices, times, and places, the name of the book, is far too cleverly titled. Many a conversation has gone into trying to explain our choice, which was that neither side would like us, which turned out to be predictably true. Neither side liked us. We were sort of shocked. Um, Cambridge University Press charged that our preferred title, Everything You Need to Know in Order Not to Have a Strong Opinion About Drug Legalization, was not academic enough. Uh, it did, however, have the merit of being perfectly comprehensible. <laughs> 
We ended up agnostic on drug legalization, uh, satisfying my own instincts for preferences for intellectual ambiguity and irony, uh, but not making policymakers' lives uh, easier. Um, our arguments can be summarized in uh, three uh, propositions. Um, the first one is very much related to an equation that Rob developed to just express the basics of how drugs affected social well-being. And this is a notion that total harm is a function of the number of users times the intensity of use times the harm per use. Now, the first of the, of the problems that we think face um, uh, those proposing legalization is the difficulty of making predictions about the effects of drug legalization, of any specific drug legalization proposal. We are confident that the number of users and the intensity of use would increase, whether it would increase twofold, tenfold. No one had any basis for a systematic prediction. In fact, very few efforts were made to make such predictions. We're also confident that the harm per use would fall very substantially. But where that left total harms was ambiguous. The second problem was that, and this is something that was referred to in discussion in the opening session uh, yesterday, is that even if we could project the effects of legalization, we end on prevalence and harms. Um, we end up with this problem of incommensurables. And I made a crack yesterday, which I'll repeat again today, if you are a University of Chicago trained economist, you can deal with this problem. You can value crime, you can value the health consequences, you can value the loss of, of civil liberties, etc. For better or for worse, even though Nobel laureates are given frequently to Chicago economists, most of us are unconvinced by that. And so we're simply left with this problem that we might eventually agree on what the consequences of legalization were, but given the difference in the composition of harms that result, it's hard to know what to make of that uh, finding. And third, finally, it's not as though the harms of prohibition and the benefits of legalization are uniformly distributed through society. Putting this in the US context, and drug war heresies was very much a, an American analysis, the harms of prohibition are disproportionately borne by low-income, minority, urban communities, where the violence and disorder from drug distribution have been concentrated. As brilliantly chronicled in the television series The Wire, and supported by numerous academic studies, but I think The Wire is the authoritative source uh, for these purposes, um, policing designed to protect the community from the problems of drug dealing and drug use have resulted in still other harms to those communities, increasing suspicion of, drug to, and, uh, of, uh, of government and more disorder. The middle class, broadly speaking, has had relatively low rates of drug dependence. Under legalization, the urban concentration of drug-related harms would be much reduced, and middle class parents would have more reason to worry that their experimenting adolescent children would end up with addiction problems. These are reasonable conjectures, not certain, but the notion that the, the, the benefits would be unevenly distributed, I think, is, is quite, uh, quite uh, uh, um, transparent. Rob and I might favor the redistribution of harms in such an unequal society as the United States, but that's a complex political judgment, and we certainly can't impose that on others. Hence, our agnosticism on the issue that many regard as the central one for drug policy. For 10 years, we did not have an opinion, after 10 years, we did not have an opinion that we wished to trumpet to the rest of the world. We think that the problems that we identified are fairly fundamental problems in making the case for uh, legalization. And for better or for worse, legalization advocates politically bear the burden of proof.
one can make philosophical normative arguments, and I think Rob did an excellent job in the book of, of doing them, as to why that might not be appropriate, but the political reality across the world will be that it is the burden of proof on the legalization advocates. Well, we may have become, been agnostic, um, but of course the world moved on anyway. Uh, marijuana legalization is now a reality in an increasing number of US states, and since late uh, 2018, Canada as well. Surely there is much to learn from that experience in terms of the consequences of legalizing the more harmful drugs, particularly cocaine, heroin, and amphetamines, which will be mostly what I talk about. And let me suggest two reasons for not modifying agnosticism about the effects of legalization on those other drugs. First, the effects of legalization will take a long time to play out. Even Colorado and Washington states, the pioneering jurisdictions, have been operating legal marijuana for just five years. Prices continue to fall rapidly. Uh, uh, John Corkins this morning uh, presented uh, data showing the decline in cannabis prices in Washington state of, I think, two-thirds uh, from the original legal, uh, legal price. And a, and, and a very clear continued fall. And the notion that the cannabis problem will look different when the price of an hour of intoxication gets down to 20 cents uh, is quite clear. And we simply have not observed yet what, the, what cannabis use, and what cannabis problems will look like when it gets to be as cheap as that, as is, as is very likely. We've observed an increase in prevalence amongst older uh, adults, but not yet amongst, amongst the young. Um, and there's a change in the nature of the products that are available, and American entrepreneurialism being what it is, I'm sure we have not yet seen all the wonderful products that American entrepreneurs will develop for this, uh, for this market. I mean, it's really striking to compare what's available in Washington or Oregon as to what's available in coffee shops in, in the Netherlands, where there was nothing to, to, to limit product innovation, but um, Dutch is stodgy. You know, it's basically just the old smoked stuff. Uh, the US, that has, there is an enormous array of, of different ways of consuming, uh, uh, consuming cannabis. This, the second reason to sort of think that there are limits to what we can learn from, from cannabis legalization is that um, uh, it's the one illegal drug whose use had become a, a, a normal component of adolescent development, not just in the US, but in much of Western Europe, not including uh, Sweden, Sweden and Norway. More than 50% of 20-year-olds had at least tried the drug uh, and that had been true for decades in the U.S. and for shorter periods in, in, in Western Europe. For other, no other drug is at more than 10% that have tried. So legalization of cannabis was providing easier and cheaper access to a drug that had been readily accessible, very different from the experience of legalizing a drug which had been essentially not accessible for much of, much of the population. I believe that in the long run, we will learn something as we learn from the uh, experience with alcohol prohibition, but it's still a long way off, and what we learn will be very drug-specific, and it'll be complex to translate that into uh, specific lessons for cocaine, mar uh, heroin, or, or another, another drug. Um, some of the lessons, of course, will be very context-specific. I'm inclined to think that regulatory capture, the experience in which the industry gets to regulate the industry, is certainly more prominent in the American political system, American system in part because of the way politics is financed in the, in the US. Um, we no longer have a corruption problem. We've simply legalized it. Um, the uh, industry in Colorado, and uh, in, in Colorado in particular, has been very active in the, in the regulation of, of of the industry. So, the remainder of my talk will focus on illegal markets. 
takes prohibition as given. And my goals, two goals, one is to persuade you that drug policy research has accomplished something, and the second is that there's an interesting policy research agenda for you to contribute to. Um, my, my focus has been on drug enforcement. It was certainly the focus of this, this talk will be on drug enforcement, partly because I think it's the source of many of the harms that we're concerned with, but secondly because I think it's of particular interest to a criminological audience. And my major interest, which I will get to through a series of steps, is how do illegal drug markets respond to enforcement, because I think that is the critical policy issue. So I started my career as an economist. I think I've turned into something else. But um, it wasn't a bad starting point uh, when I got involved with drug research. Because drugs are mostly sold in markets, not exclusively. There's certainly social networks that distribute drugs, particularly drugs like ecstasy. They play a role. But the fact that they're mostly sold in markets means that you can start thinking about factors that affect demand and factors that affect a supply. Interventions sometimes have effects on both, but it's a useful classification. And secondly, it gets you to think about prices. And a lot of the discussion will be about prices, but prices in illegal drug markets are particularly difficult to study. So there are some, I think, interesting insights that come from uh, economic analysis of, of, of drug markets and drug policy. Uh, 30 years ago, a young economist at, at RAND, as part of a study that I was directing, looked at the effect of increasing the effectiveness of drug interdiction on the export demand for drugs from for cocaine from Colombia. So let's say the interdictors have been seizing one third of what's shipped to the US, and they get better at it, and now they seize one half. And you might say, well, that reduces consumption. And the answer is, well, probably. I'll suggest some reasons why that might not be a strong effect, but let's say it reduces consumption by a fifth, which is a large number in this case. There's a second effect which is that the higher risk of seizure means that you have to send more kilos of cocaine from Colombia to the US in order to deliver one kilo. And that second effect, under most reasonable assumptions about elasticities in the market, is substantially stronger than the first. So the result is that more effective interdiction increases export demand for cocaine from Colombia, even as it reduces consumption in the United States. So when the first time I met with the drug czar's office staff, I told them that the US government was the leading source of demand for Colombian cocaine, it went down badly. Um, I was younger. I liked being provocative. I think gotten out of that. Um, but. Um, uh, it, it was not an unreasonable statement, and uh, it is a useful insight about the sort of unintended consequences of, uh, of drug policy. Second insight comes from work that, again, Rob McCoon and I did um, on drug markets in Washington, D.C. And what we observed was that we, we interv interviewed had a staff that interviewed uh, retail drug sellers in Washington in 1988. Uh, and we found that most of them held legitimate jobs. They weren't merely dealers. They earned more per hour in their drug selling, but spent more hours in their lower paid legitimate work. And we realized that drug selling at that stage was for them moonlighting, well paid moonlighting, because the drug market is not a sort of 24-7, or back then was not a 24-7, it was in fact very hard to work 40 hours a week productively in drug selling. And so we could see that 
in thinking about the supply of drug selling labor, you had to take into account the legitimate job opportunities that they, that they had. Economists have also raised an issue of what is the optimal price for an illegal drug. Now, all police agencies are proud of raising drug prices. Um, and the argument would be higher prices of drugs, reduce demand, hence reduce the harms associated with drugs. They may reduce the harms associated with drug use, but there are a set of harms that come from drug markets themselves. And in many studies of the elasticity for demand, it is found that for drugs, as for alcohol and tobacco, the demand is inelastic. That's not to say it doesn't respond to price, but it doesn't respond to price strongly. So a 10% increase in the price of drugs might reduce consumption by 5%. Well, what's interesting about that, what that means is the higher price generates higher revenues for drug sellers and increases the incentives for, profit, for income producing crime by drug users. So through multiple mechanisms, higher prices may actually cause considerable harm. One of them is that, it's sort of interesting, it relates to work that uh, Steve Levitt of Freakonomics fame and uh, ethnographer named Sudhir Venkatesh uh, uh, sort of issue that they posed studying a group of uh, drug dealers, of, of crack dealers in Chicago uh, about 20 years ago. Um, the, this, this is a paper which ended up in a version of a chapter in, in Freakonomics entitled, Why Do Drug Dealers Live With Their Mothers? And the argument was that drug dealers actually earned very low wages, or had very low earnings, as retailers but they were sort of entering into a, a tournament, was the, the term that, that Levitt and Venkatesh used, where you, you came in as a low-level drug dealer in order to have the opportunity to rise to be a, a senior drug seller, and with higher prices, the reward was going to be higher for being a leader, and so it would actually attract more into drug selling. So, through multi so there's the issue. What is the optimal price? unanswerable question, but it's an important insight that not necessarily, is not necessarily desirable to be raising the price of illegal drugs. Okay, so, still an economist back in 1986, I worked with Mark Kleiman in developing a sort of a model to try to explain what determines the price of illegal drugs. And then an expanded, and I think, richer version of it, more dynamic, uh, was put together with uh, Jonathan Corkins and I published one in 2000 and 2010, but I think the same insights are, are there. And let's start with the observation that the price of illegal drugs is extraordinarily high. I won't go through all the comparisons, but you know, there have been periods in which a, a pure gram of heroin, a semi-refined agricultural product, um, cost $500. Uh, and it's not as though illegality of itself makes everything expensive. I had started my research by studying illegal gambling, and illegal gambling, the margins as compared to what turned into the legal market were really quite modest. The most plausible explanation for why illegal drugs were so expensive were the risks that participants faced in the market. But, the labor input was quite slight. Material costs, in terms of sort of purchase in, of, of the opium in, in, in Afghanistan or Mexico, was quite modest. Uh, the markets, it turned out, were competitive. You didn't have to worry about monopolies, raising, raising prices. So it seemed that risks might be the explanation. And suppliers of drugs face a, a large and varied set of risks. There are risks from the government. The government wishes to incarcerate them, seize their drugs, seize their assets. But the second set of risks, which was Mark's, uh, Mark Kleiman's great contribution, was saying, but there's a second set of risks that come from the activities of other participants in the trade. They 
you know, there are reasons why they will get into violent conflict about territories, about contracts. After all, this is a business done, you know, in the dark, without written contracts, young men, you know, with not very good self-control, etc. theft of drugs, etc. So there are two sources of risk for drug dealers. And we thought that they accounted for most of the price, retail price of drugs. And this is a slide which some members of the audience have already seen since Jonathan Corkins used it uh, earlier today. Now, this is an effort to take the study of drug dealers that Rob and I had done and convert it into an estimate of the components of cost of, of retail price of cocaine around 1990. So this is something Jonathan and I did using work that Rob and I had done. And I've just highlighted here the two most obvious elements that come from uh, uh, risks. The compensation or risk of prison, going to prison and the compensation for the physical risk. At that time, we estimated that there was a sort of one annual risk of one in 70 of being killed if you were a drug dealer in Washington and a one in 14 chance of being injured badly enough to require hospital admission. So that was, that was a very violent time. Um, there's actually more compensa risk compensation in here. You'll see that uh, higher up um, there's a figure of 8 to 11 percent for drug and asset seizures. That's again one of these risks. Without going through the details, the bulk of the cost of cocaine, retail price of cocaine, seem to be risk-related. Bravo. So, tougher enforcement should raise prices. And there are multiple mechanisms that would explain that. You know, tougher enforcement, let's say, increased risk of going to prison. You know, you'll have to pay dealers more in order for them to take that risk, so that, that'll raise price. It increases some incentives for violence in the trade because one source of violence is every dealer has to, a manager has to worry about being informed against by people who are arrested. The more, the, sa the higher the, the sanction faced by arrested people, the more their incentive for uh, informing. And so that could generate what I call disciplinary violence. Arrangements between drug market uh, enterprises that would stabilize them become more fragile with tougher enforcement. That could lead to more, to more violence. Um, so lots of reasons to think that uh, tougher enforcement should raise prices. I note here, though, that it's on top of the effect of prohibition. This is a point that actually Jonathan made more eloquently this morning which is that in my earliest work, I talked about um, the structural consequences of product illegality, which is just the notion that anything that's illegal, any activity that's illegal, has limited access then to all sorts of efficiency in enhancing activities. Technology, smart people, it's hard to get, to M get MBAs to work for a cocaine smuggler than for an auto, uh, auto parts shipper. Um, it, it's, there are lots of reasons why illegality itself imposes costs, but as I said, the risks and prices framework and the intuition suggests that tougher enforcement should raise prices further. Unfortunately, and this will be most of what I talk about for the rest of this session, is that there's minimal evidence to support a very attractive theory. It's been used in many simulation studies. I've participated in them. Uh, there's a classic one by a couple of people at RAN, Peter Rydell and Susan Everingham. Jonathan Corkins has done many with the various uh, Austrian co uh, collaborators. Um, and it's one of the, I mean, you see risks and prices, it shows sort of large, of, limited effects of, uh, if, anyway, shows some effects of drug enforcement on, on prices. But of course, it's built into the model. And simulation studies are a nice illustration of my, one of my favorite Mark Twain statements, which is, 
Science is a wonderful thing, such a small investment in fact for such a large return in speculation. And that describes simulations perfectly. It is in fact difficult to test risks and prices empirically because, and I don't have time to spend much on this, drug markets are quite local and you need to have price data at a local level to match with enforcement stringency measures. Harold Pollack and I, five years ago, did a almost systematic review of all the studies of uh, drug enforcement and their effects on prices and found minimal evidence to support uh, the claim that tougher enforcement uh, raised prices. You might just say, well, the research hasn't been strong enough. However, there is a set of data that makes the case rather so it makes the case of the ineffectiveness of enforcement rather more graphically. And here I've simply tracked the uh, decline in the price of cocaine and heroin over a 30 year period, 1980 to 2010 roughly, against the, in, the rising number of incarcerations for drug offenses. So this is predominantly for drug selling. Some of them appear to be drug possession cases, often that's a, a plea bargain deal by a, by a dealer. What this suggests, and it's crude, but what it suggests is that a massive increase in enforcement has not prevented a substantial decline in prices. There are some possible explanations for why prices are insensitive to enforcement. Um, it might be that sort of the observed intensity of variation in how risky drug selling is is actually not very great. I think I, I think I can show that that's not true for cocaine and heroin dealers in the U.S. Uh, I at one stage fell in love with the notion of barriers to exit, which was that drug sellers, after a while, had accumulated such long criminal histories and addiction treatment histories that they basically had lost their potential, their, their legitimate uh, workforce opportunities, and so they're kind of trapped into drug selling. Um, and Jonathan and I, together with an economist, developed a sort of clever little model which suggested that enforcement so sort of selects out the most violent dealers, or if it did select out the most violent dealers, that actually the tougher enforcement would increase government risk but reduce participant risks, and that might lead to a decline in, in price. I don't think any of these is very powerful in explaining this sustained and substantial decline. So what I then became interested in is the notion that drug markets are different, illegal drug markets. And I said, going to talk about three paradoxes. One that I think illustrate this. One, the simplest one is, why do heroin smugglers spend lots of money smuggling worthless powder? The second is, how do these markets operate when in fact nobody knows what they're buying or what they're selling in terms of the purity of the drug? And third, why has fentanyl, this dramatically cheaper opioid, not spread further either in North America or more importantly in Western Europe? So here's some data that Leticia Poli and I collected course of working on our book on heroin, world heroin market. And this gives the purity of heroin seizures in Turkey, and these are large seizures. Turkey is a transit country for, for heroin, and these are typically multiple kilos. And what you'll notice is that the percentage, that the purity is typically substantially less than 50%. So they're smuggling 50% of heroin and 50% of some worthless white powder. Why, do they, why is that a puzzle? Well, the bulk raises the cost for the smugglers. First of all, it's easier to, to detect a two kilo package than a one kilo package. Secondly, pilots and corrupt officials don't test the purity and say, well, we're only charging $1,000 per pure kilogram. They just weigh the kilogram. And so whatever powder is in it, that will cost you money to pay the pilot, to pay the, the, the corrupt official. 
it, it sort of, on its face, doesn't make sense that they're not uh, smuggling essentially pure heroin. The hypothesis that that generates is the notion that purity is kind of a strategic choice. And our simple models are get conf of, of economic markets that generate a sort of simple prediction of the effect of enforcement are sort of confused by the purity. So let me go to the evidence that purity is not simply a sort of incidental characteristic. I mean, we buy whiskey versus wine versus beer, and we know roughly what the alcohol content is. That is not the situation faced in the retail heroin market. And so this is a quote from a 20-year-old paper on uh, retail heroin in, in the US. What exactly is in street heroin, how pure it is, and what the effects of different cuts, dil dilutants are, is it the subject of much discussion on the street, assays of street level heroin in New York City, found a sample of 40 bags, at least 27 types of adulterants. They don't know what they're buying. Well, it's not just, that's not an American exceptionalism, it's not even a New York exceptionalism. Here are some observations of the purity of heroin at the retail level in the city in France, Rennes, 2007-2008. So the, actually interesting where these data come from. The Dutch Drug Observatory every year picks one drug and has a, a sort of a panel of users that it invites to bring in their latest purchase of that drug for testing. But they also ask, how good is this? I want to comment on both things. So the first thing you observe here is the enormous variability. So this is one city over a 15-month period, and even within any sort of short period, you can see that you could be buying 2% pure, or you could be buying 15% pure, and, and I can show the distribution, but it, it's a very uniform distribution over quite a broad, broad thing. Well, okay, maybe they buy knowing. Well, in fact, when they're asked about the quality of their purchase, it turns out they have, you know, it's very poorly correlated, or very weakly correlated with the actual purity. So they're as likely to say, this is good stuff if it was 5% as if it was 15%. And it's not just street users that uh, are confused about this. I, I ought to have uh, a picture from the traffic, from the uh, film Traffic, but just uh, let me tell what it is. So, um, in Traffic, which is based on a German uh, television series, uh, a uh, drug smuggler in the US, the importer, uh, gets caught by DEA and his wife takes over. And his wife goes down to Mexico to meet with the exporter and there's a big pile of, uh, of cocaine bundles there. And she opens one of the bundles and licks her finger, you know, takes some cocaine off the top, licks it and says, it's good. And actually, I'm not sure, but I think that is what first got me interested in this issue. What do they actually know? Um, and the, the, uh, Bryce Pardo told me that, that he can sort of show me other instances of, of this kind of thing in, in, in film, but in, in, in Australia, seizures of multi-kilo shipments of heroin have product labels on them, you know, to assure quality. 777 is sort of famously the, 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 num the, the label that's used throughout the world to indicate high quality of heroin. I'm sure there's an explanation for that. And you think, what, what information does anyone think there is in a package label uh, for illegal heroin? But, but there it is, because they in fact don't know. The tech, um, and Jonathan tracked this very interesting blog exchange. Um, I've highlighted here, these are you know, a bunch of people talking about, well, can you test for the purity of cocaine? And Johnny Blaze says, here's one way to exact test. Not exact, but you, you'll get an idea of how it is. Take a small, clear glass of bleach, take some soil, and it goes through it, and then 
you know, Easy E says, Clorox test is a myth. It doesn't really tell you anything. Easy test will launch a test for cocaine. Uh, and it's clear, everyone's just sort of stumbling around, trying to figure out how pure is what they're, what they're buying. Well, so let's put those two things together. One is, no one knows the purity, and the second one is, they're not good at identifying the purity even after the fact. So they take the heroin, and they, they consume the heroin, and some studies suggest you can't really tell the difference between 20% and 40% purity. So then the interesting question is, well, why would anyone sell 40% purity if they could get away with selling 20% and the consumer's just as satisfied? And this is the classic market for lemons. And George Akerlof um, wrote this article 50 years ago about how markets can collapse if the seller is better informed than the buyer. And he explained, got Nobel Prize for it, explained how it gets rescued. Uh, Rosalie Pakula, a longtime collaborator at Rand and a couple of other economists, sort of figured out a way in which you could explain how the market, heroin market operated, taking into account the fact that buyers typically have multiple sources. So one of the ways they assess quality of their main dealer is by testing buying from other dealers. It's a very expensive way for a market to equilibrate itself. It's sort of another way in which the, the market does not work as predicted. My third sort of paradox relates to fentanyl. Now let me just sort of go through the basic facts about fentanyl. This is a long-established uh, you know, long opioid, um, but as Bryce Perdue has shown, there were new synthesis methods developed around 2012 which made it easier and cheaper to refine, uh, uh, refine fent produce fentanyl. In morphine equivalent doses, fentanyl is 1% as expensive as heroin purchased at the sort of low wholesale, wholesale level. The dominant source is Chinese pharmaceutical chemical industry, very large, it's the largest in the world, very poorly regulated, not just with respect to this, but, but, it, but in general. Access to fentanyl could not be easier. So Bryce gave me my one interesting graphic, which is uh, you know, a fentanyl site, uh, you know, one of these sites. And what you can see is that fentanyl um, is readily purchased and you can get 50 grams for the cut price of $459. Well, you know, so a kilo would cost you $5,000. That compares to many tens of thousands of dollars for a kilo of heroin, and this is substantially more potent than the heroin. So this is a dramatic decrease. So you would think that fentanyl would spread broadly. It hasn't. Fentanyl is an important, has been the source of an, a large number of deaths in the U, United States, but it is not a national problem yet. 2004, the states that are in black have, or have very little fentanyl. Other colors, and you can see the color chart to the right, are suggest you know, fentanyl presence. And uh, you, you can see that fentanyl is just starting to show up in the New England and the uh, lower Midwest. By 2017, you can see those same states are now very seriously affected by fentanyl with rates over 20 deaths per 100,000. Whereas in the West Coast, you might have rates of less than two per 100,000. Why does this fit into my narrative? Well, the question is why has, and, and sorry, I should say, and Canada shows the same thing. British Columbia and Alberta have very high uh, overdose rates per capita. Uh, Quebec, the other large, uh, uh, Quebec has a, you know, a rate uh, one-sixth of that. It, it is a very concentrated. Why has fentanyl 
not yet spread further. The standard accounts are quite unpersuasive to my mind. Uh, first is that um, you know, it, 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 doesn't, it can't be sold in the western part of the United States because they have black tar heroin. And you sort of, even someone as scientifically ignorant as I sort of thinks, hard to believe that this is really a major technological barrier. And in fact, if you talk to drug researchers, they say it's perfectly doable, but it has not yet, not yet happened. Um, for, the, for Europe, the standard account is, oh, heroin demand is declining, so why would dealers seek a cheaper opioid? And the answer is, exactly. They would seek a cheaper opioid. Declining market, they're trying to maintain their profit level. This is exactly the incentive for doing it. So we really don't have an explanation beyond, well, maybe diffusion is going to be very slow, but that really raises, the, simply shifts the question, why is diffusion so slow? And again, I think it's sort of this problem that we do not understand how drug markets work. So, concluding comments, and I want to divide them into two components. One is the drug market research agenda. It would be nice to say, ah, we have to collect the data and subject it to our powerful quantitative methods. I think this is quite unlikely because the targets of our inquiry are particularly hard to identify uh, and um, obtain information about. I think there's a large ethnographic uh, literature that's useful. Jonathan Corkins has uh, worked at one stage with some ethnographers and on the cost of, of distribution, specific costs, which very, I think, produced interesting work. And I think there's a lot more that could be done of that kind. I think the return will, in general, be to opportunism in data collection. I worked with a criminologist, Melvin Sedine, who's in the national police of the Dutch National Police. We got access to data on with, uh, the, the accounting books of a set of enterprises that sent uh, euros back to Colombia and I think revealed a lot of interesting characteristics of the, uh, of, of the cocaine smuggling market. That uh, Paolo Campana and Federico Verisi have learned a lot from analysis of Sicilian mafia wiretaps. I mean, none of these are easily replicated, but it is, we're going to learn by taking advantage of lots of these, lots of these things. And I think cross-national comparisons are going to be particularly useful. Why did fentanyl get established in Fent Estonia since 2002, drive out heroin? Not happened in any other market. Um, okay. Uh, second set of comments deal with policy. I have mostly emphasized the limitations of our knowledge. I want to go back and suggest that's actually important. We have no evidence that tougher enforcement will drive prices up. We know that prohibition raises cost prices, etc. But if tougher enforcement can do little to raise price, then the issue is why should we be enforcing drug prohibitions very aggressively? It's clear that there is a role for enforcement that aims at specific harms. We're concerned about drug selling that's very concentrated, has location, has, you know, generates local disorder. Um, we're concerned about uh, drug dealers who corrupt local, local police, are concerned about violence, etc. Enforcement that aims at those specific harms clearly has a major role. But locking up drug dealers on the claim that this will increase drug prices has a certain cost and a very unlikely gain. And we should pay attention to that. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this session. Thank you very much for attending session. There are session in the next, well, for 30 minutes or something. Thank you very much.